Hello, I'm John Cairns from the University of British Columbia and together with Jason Andrade, also from the University of British Columbia, we'll be discussing today the uh, 2016 CCS uh, guidelines update for management of atrial fibrillation, focusing on those patients who have both atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease. These are my disclosures. These are Jason's disclosures. Uh, our uh, approach is uh, based uh, on the CCS algorithm, uh, first of all. Uh, this was d defined back in uh, 2014, uh, and uh, from this algorithm uh, you can see that most patients with uh, atrial fibrillation uh, are best managed with an oral anticoagulant. Uh, those at uh, low risk, uh, people who don't have coronary disease or have no evidence of vascular uh, disease, need no antithrombotic therapy. And those free of any risk factor apart from coronary artery disease or vascular disease, uh, aspirin is considered to be appropriate therapy. Also note that uh, when an oral anticoagulant is uh, recommended, uh, our preference is for the use of a NOAC uh, in that, those instances. The uh, rationale for preferring a NOAC uh, over warfarin, uh, there is uh, a widespread recognition of the convenience and ease of use for both patients and physicians, and there's extensive evidence uh, that the NOACs are at least as effective and safe as warfarin, and in some instances there are NOACs that are more effective than warfarin, and there are NOACs that are uh, safer than warfarin. Uh, and uh, these uh, two uh, overviews uh, just show the overall picture from the, more, the four major trials uh, of the NOACs versus warfarin. Uh, another reason to prefer a NOAC over uh, warfarin uh, is based on the fact that uh, uh, when you use these agents along with uh, either one or two antiplatelet agents, there's clearly more bleeding. Uh, but this is no more marked uh, with, in this instance, uh, dibigatran in either 150 or 110 milligram dose, no more bleeding than there is uh, when these agents are combined uh, with uh, this NOAC than with warfarin. Uh, and uh, the efficacy uh, of the agent compared to warfarin is not altered in any way by the addition of an antiplatelet agent. The background to the rationale for this uh, concern with patients with concomitant atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease is that it's quite common. About 30% of patients ha have both together, and the management is challenging, the antithrombotic management. And this is because oral anticoagulation is preferred for the prevention of stroke in most patients with atrial fibrillation, and antiplatelet agents are preferred uh, for the prevention of coronary events following uh, non-ST segment elevation, acute coronary syndromes, STEMI, or PCI. And out of this emerges a rationale, and a, one that's actually widely used, is the combination of both an oral anticoagulant and an antiplatelet agent, triple therapy, uh, for both uh, post-PCI and ACS patients. We've uh, focused uh, on three groups uh, of patients for consideration of these uh, guidelines. First are those patients with AF and an indication for primary uh, coronary artery disease prevention uh, or who have stable coronary artery disease. Patients who have AF and recent elective PCI and patients with AF in association with non-ST segment elevation, ACS or STEMI. Uh, the evidence uh, in regard to patients with stable coronary artery disease uh, derives from the primary prevention trials uh, using aspirin. There are 660,000 patient years of follow-up available. There's a statistically significant 12% reduction in serious vascular events. Secondary prevention, including patients with stable angina, 16 trials, 43,000 years of patient follow-up, a very, very strongly to statistically significant 19% reduction in serious vascular events. It's interesting that there are multiple trials of warfarin versus aspirin in these secondary and primary prevention situations, and the general finding is that warfarin is at least as effective as aspirin, but there's clearly more bleeding, and uh, this uh, uh, has led to the usual approach uh, for prevention or for secondary prevention being aspirin rather than warfarin. Uh, and then finally, another important piece of evidence is in the four trials of a NOAC versus warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation, there's an overall 12% reduction of mortality, suggesting that uh, from that perspective, 
the NOAC uh, may be preferable uh, to warfarin. So this leads us uh, to uh, the recommendations we've established for the first group of patients, coronary artery disease prevention or stable coronary artery disease. We suggest, first of all, you categorize patients by their risk of stroke. If it's very low, no antithrombotic therapy is indicated. If they're under age 65 and have a CHADS of zero, but they have vascular disease, aspirin, and for the majority of these patients who are either over the age of 65 or have one CHADS risk factor, uh, uh, oral anticoagulation alone is sufficient. And when that is recommended, uh, we suggest a NOAC uh, over warfarin. Thanks, John. So that brings us to the second category that we have to look at. And so this is patients with atrial fibrillation who have undergone a recent elective PCI, so the non-ACS population. Uh, remembering that we're stuck with this uh, contrasting balance of risk. So on the one side, we prefer oral anticoagulation therapy to prevent AF-related stroke and systemic embolism. And we know that dual antiplatelet in this group is less effective uh, based on the active W trial. Conversely, in patients who are undergoing stenting, we prefer dual antiplatelet therapy. We know that it's superior to aspirin based on the Credo trial, uh, but it's also superior to aspirin plus vitamin K antagonists that we know from ISAR and STARS. And so we have these contrasting risks of thrombotic events and myocardial events versus the contrasting risk against stroke and systemic embolism. As a result, we've combined these therapies and tended to focus on oral anticoagulation therapy plus dual antiplatelet therapy, or what we call triple therapy. There's been some observational trials done uh, that have looked at the two basic things on either end. So on one hand, we have the risks of major bleeding. We know that triple therapy will increase the risks of major bleeding substantially over uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. But interestingly, in these observational trials, there does not seem to be any difference, uh, or at least there seems to be a slightly higher event rate in the triple therapy group in terms of death, myocardial infarction, uh, repeat coronary intervention, stroke, or stent thrombrosis. So even though we have a theoretical rationale why triple therapy may be better, there's observational evidence suggesting harm and potentially no significant benefit. There was a trial undertaken in this population of elective PCI, uh, which is the WOST trial. So it's 573 patients who underwent uh, intervention. They're all on warfarin. About 70% had atrial fibrillation as their primary diagnosis, and about 65% received a drug-eluting stent. What they showed was uh, what you would expect, that the rates of any bleeding was substantially higher in the triple therapy arm compared to the dual arm, which was warfarin plus uh, an antiplatelet agent. And so it was a 44% risk of any bleeding in the triple therapy group versus a 19% risk in the dual therapy group. Conversely, we didn't see an increased event in the dual therapy group. So if you looked at the triple therapy group, the rate of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, uh, target vessel revascularization, and stent thrombosis was actually higher in the triple therapy group at 17.6% compared to the 11% we saw in the dual antiplatelet group. Uh, when you go back to the meta-analysis, so taking the observational trials, but also including the randomized trial WOST, you see that the risk of major bleeding is higher in the triple therapy group compared to the dual therapy group, so uh, clopidogrel plus an oral anticoagulant. But you also see the same benefit in terms of the adverse coronary outcomes being lower in the dual group versus the triple therapy group. So uh, for uh, patients with uh, concomitant atrial fibrillation and recent elective PCI, uh, we've uh, developed an algorithm based on the evidence that you've just had presented. Uh, we recommend that initially these patients be categorized uh, with regard to their risk of stroke. Patients at low risk, under the age of 65, with a CHADS uh, score of zero, uh, the recommendation is simply dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months and then conversion to aspirin alone after 12 months. For people at higher risk of stroke, over age 65, or with a CHAD score of one or greater, uh, the WUST regime is recommended uh, for the first 12 months. That is, a combination of oral anticoagulation and clopidogrel. And then converting, because these patients need oral anticoagulation, to oral anticoagulation alone uh, after 12 months. Uh, the duration of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy has been the subject of uh, intensive examination in the past several years. Uh, the issue is whether or not dual antiplatelet therapy should be continued beyond 12 months. Uh, 
those studies that have looked at this carefully generally find that there are in fact fewer myocardial infarctions and stent thrombosis, but to counterbalance this, more major bleeding and probably more death. Uh, therefore, uh, one is faced by trying to balance the risk of these thrombotic events prevented uh, uh, with risk of bleeding caused and to individualize the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. There's also been the issue of what kind of stent to use and with the uh, development of the second generation drug eluting stents, uh, it's clear now that there are actually fewer coronary events including MI and stent thrombosis with the, dual, uh, with the uh, uh, drug eluting stent than with the uh, bare metal stent uh, which has been a significant piece of information and accordingly when we make this algorithm recommendation we've also provided some uh, practical tips to consider uh, and these would be perhaps patients with a very high risk of stent thrombosis and an acceptable uh, major bleeding risk, uh, they might stay on uh, their uh, combination therapies for longer than 12 months. Uh, in some of these patients, uh, uh, particularly those, uh, say, with left main uh, coronary uh, dilatations, with uh, uh, diffuse three-vessel disease, with uh, perhaps diabetes, uh, even consideration might be given to a short period of triple therapy uh, prior to the combination of oral anticoagulation and clopidogrel. And that the other extreme, people with uh, particularly high risks of uh, major bleeding, uh, the regimen of uh, aspirin clopidogrel or oral anticoagulant clopidogrel might be shortened uh, to uh, less than 12 months before they're converted to either aspirin alone or oral anticoagulation. So the last group we'll discuss is those with atrial fibrillation who present with an acute coronary syndrome. So we know from the CURE trial, which is a landmark trial uh, examining the use of uh, aspirin plus either uh, clopidogrel or aspirin plus placebo, that there was substantial benefit in terms of repeat events with the use of dual antiplatelet therapy. So this underlies much of the recommendations that we've seen before, but also focuses it through to the uh, acute coronary syndrome population. More recently, similar trials have been done, uh, which Triton Timmy, which looked at Prazogrel, as well as Plato, which looked at Ticagrelor. And in comparison to clopidogrel, we did see substantial uh, benefit over and above uh, what was seen with the dual antiplatelet therapy with these two novel agents. So returning back to our uh, observational meta-analysis that we reviewed earlier. So just as a reminder, the rates of major bleeding are substantially higher in the triple therapy group when compared to dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the benefit, uh, at least in these observational studies uh, for triple therapy over dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, doesn't seem as strong. Uh, when we look at the dual therapy, so clopidogrel plus an oral anticoagulant compared to triple therapy, again, there's an increased risk of major bleeding in the triple therapy group. Uh, but again, there does not appear to be a translation in terms of benefit in, in terms of death or repeat coronary events. And so the evidence we have supporting triple therapy is maybe not as strong as uh, we would maybe hope. Uh, in this regard, there are three ongoing trials uh, that we look forward to the publication to help inform our practice. Uh, so there's nothing randomized up to this point, looking at the NOACs as part of a dual or triple therapy regimen. Uh, John discussed previously uh, some retrospective data uh, with dabigatran, but in terms of the other NOACs and in terms of prospective randomized data, uh, there are three trials ongoing. So the first is Pioneer uh, PCI. So this is a trial of rivaroxaban as part of a triple therapy regimen with a very low dose formulation, so 2.5. Uh, this is being compared to rivaroxaban 15 uh, plus a P2Y12 inhibitor uh, versus traditional uh, warfarin-based triple therapy. The second trial that's ongoing is the Redual PCI. So this is a, a similar trial, except it's looking at the use of uh, low-dose dabigatran with a P2Y12 inhibitor. Uh, versus high-dose dabigatran against a P2Y12 inhibitor versus uh, traditional triple therapy and those with PCI and stenting. And then the last trial is Augustus, which is looking at a Pixaban plus a P2Y12 inhibitor uh, versus Warfarin plus a P2Y12 uh, inhibitor. Uh, and then there's a factorial design with aspirin or placebo in patients with PCI or stenting. So we look forward to these trials uh, to help inform our practice down the road, uh, but it'll be a while before we have evidence here to help guide us. So our challenge has been to put together a reasonable algorithm uh, which uh, represents uh, a processing of uh, 
less than uh, ideal data. Uh, we have much observational information. Uh, we have some uh, underlying randomized trials, but as Jason has pointed out, uh, the really strong evidence, uh, which would incorporate uh, uh, evidence-based approaches to the use of the NOACs uh, in these settings, uh, is still awaited. So, uh, similar to the other situations, we'd suggest, first of all, that patients be categorized according to their risk of stroke. Under the age of 65, CHADS equals zero, rather low risk. Over 65 or any CHADS risk factor, a higher risk. In the low-risk group, uh, uh, think about uh, these ACS patients uh, in terms of no PCI or having a PCI. And then for the no PCI group, uh, the therapy recommended would be the combination of either aspirin plus uh, ticagrelor or aspirin plus clopidogrel for up to 12 months and then conversion to aspirin alone after that. Those undergoing a PCI uh, aspirin plus any of uh, ticagrelor, prasugrel, or clopidogrel uh, for 12 months, and then conversion to aspirin alone after 12 months. Over on the higher stroke risk side, again, dividing the patients into those with no PCI and those who have a PCI. So no PCI, the recommended therapy would be the WUST type regimen, oral anticoagulation plus clopidogrel for 12 months, and then oral anticoagulation alone, the PCI group are at the highest risk of uh, coronary events, and they're in the group with a high stroke risk as well. So the suggestion is uh, an initial three to six months of triple therapy, uh, converting the patients then to a combination of oral anticoagulant and clopidogrel for the remainder of the 12 months, and then going on to oral anticoagulation alone after 12 months. Uh, every possible measure should be taken to reduce bleeding. This means avoiding prasugrel and ticagrelor in conjunction with an oral anticoagulant, trying to lower uh, the INR range if warfarin is being used, considering the lower of effective doses of NOACs available if it's being used, delaying uh, non-urgent catheterization until there's clarity about coagulation and renal status, and finally a variety of measures uh, during invasive procedures including use of radial access, small diameter sheaths, early removal from the femoral site if it's used, and minimize use of acute procedural antithrombotic therapies. And finally, considering routine use of proton pump inhibitors to decrease the uh, likelihood of GI bleeding. This is a complex algorithm. Uh, the uh, algorithm provides a framework, but we've also suggested a number of practical tips that may be particularly applicable uh, to uh, invasive cardiologists who are undertaking these procedures. So they may decide that some people over in the right-hand group, high risk of stroke, undergoing PCI, uh, may need uh, the uh, intensive therapies uh, for less duration of time if they're at high risk of bleeding or if their stroke risk is on the relatively uh, lower side. And uh, a variety of regimens are suggested as alternatives to the ones proposed in this framework. So uh, we, we'd, uh, on behalf of, of Jason and myself, we'd like to thank you for tuning into this uh, video. We hope you found it useful. Uh, it's quite uh, detailed, uh, and uh, if you uh, wish to pursue those details, they are available in the publication from the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. Uh, there's extensive materials available on the CCS website. There is an app uh, for your device, uh, which uh, we hope is user-friendly and contains, uh, in essence, all of this information in a usable, uh, uh, just-in-time uh, format, uh, which we hope you will find clinically useful. Thank you.